Ichigo, Clark, and the others would make their way through the Dongai, the barrier line that passed between the human realm and the soul society. However, the walls of the Dongai were closing in upon them, Yoruichi attempting to keep the group's focus on their primary objective, not to focus on the closing behind them, but instead to the opening that lied just ahead. Deciding to take matters into his own hand, of course, Clark scooped up everyone quickly, even Yoroichi, warning for everyone to hang on for dear life. Using his power, he flew them straight across through the Dongai and straight into the Soul Society. Of course, the alarms would begin to go off inside of the Serite, the home of the Soul Reapers, far off from the outskirts, more towards the western district of the Rukon, an area where souls that were passed through by Soul Reapers would reside. Although the Rukon district were many layers to itself, it wasn't uncommon for souls within this area not to reconvene with close friends or loved ones or family whom they lost. But the group had reached their first goal, to make it into the Soul Society. And as Yoruichi would point out, the great wall surrounding the Serite itself, that was their entrance into the Soul Society. Well, what are we waiting for? Ichigo said. The gate's right there. All we gotta do is bust through and get in. Hold on, Ichigo, Clark would ask him. We need to come up with a plan of attack. What do you mean? All we gotta do is burst in there, locate Rukia with your, you know, x-ray vision and whatnot, and then we can just grab her and get out. I know. I want to try to scope the entire area. I'm gonna go into the sky and get a better look. Clark would fly into the air, everyone watching on as he hovered higher and higher above them, as he got a good view of just how big the Serite really was. He was going to attempt to see if he could fly in, but Yorichi would quickly stop him. No, Clark, that's dangerous, the cat said. Huh? Why? I mean, it seems perfectly clear to me. I'm pretty sure I can lift all of you no problem. All we have to do is fly over the wall. We don't really have to try to lift the gate or go through it or anything like that. And then one fell swoop, we'll already be inside. It's not that simple. Focus around the Serite. With your vision, you should be able to see it. My vision? Your X-ray vision. Oh. Clark would activate his X-ray vision. He was able to see through the walls of the Serite, as well as seeing various members of the Soul Reapers Society moving along and caring about their business. But he could also see something else. Guys? Yeah, what is it? This is going to sound really crazy. But the whole Serite, it's, it's inside a dome. A dome? A dome. It's a big dome. It's, it's like it's inside of a bubble. Half of it is on top, but the other half is down below. It's, it's trapped inside of a sphere, Yorichi would tell them. It's not one that can easily be broken through. If you were to attempt to reach it, your body might be destroyed in the process. <sighs> then what can we do? Like I said, we're going to have to go through the gate. Ichigo would attempt to enter in through the western gate, only for its doors to be closed, as a large giant of a man would stand before him, wielding a giant axe. This being went by the name of Gidambo. He was the guardian of the western gate of the Serite, and under his supervision, in the 300 years he had served, not once had anyone ever gotten past him, nor defeated him. He engaged with Ichigo in one-on-one -on -one combat, though much to his dismay, he could not crush the strange, spiky-haired intruder. 
Clark would watch on with everyone else as the giant axe-wielding guardian would attempt to crush Ichigo over and over and over again, even pulling out two axes, and yet it did him no good. He had no way of stopping Ichigo, so much so that when Ichigo responded in kind, his axes were destroyed. He had no choice but to view it as a sound defeat. And he was saddened by the loss of his two battle axes that he had praised so much. It had been his responsibility to look after the gate, and now he could no longer fulfill that role. Though Clark was there to be kind and supportive, apologizing for his brother's antics. I'm, I'm really sorry, sir, Clark would say. I'm sorry about the loss of your battle axes. I can tell they must have really meant a lot to you. They, they did. <laughs> they were my prized possessions. Wow. I didn't know they really meant that much to you. I'm sorry, Ichigo would say. But you kept attacking me. I had to defend myself somehow. It was a battle of warriors. It's only natural that I must accept defeat. Still, perhaps you're not the punk juvenile delinquent that I thought you were. Punk juvenile delinquent? Yeah, I mean, with the bright orange spiky hair, it's obvious you weren't born like that. What did you say? I'll have you know. I got my hair from my mom, thank you. Clark and the others would hold back Ichigo from Janimbo and his comments. But the giant had admitted defeat. And as such, he felt he was only obligated to open the wall for them and to let them into the Serite. As he attempted to do so, however... There was an unfamiliar face waiting to greet them. Yorichi had become rather nervous at this. The cat knew very well who was standing before them, and it didn't like their odds. Of all people, why did it have to be him? Huh? Who is it? Ichigo would ask. It's Gein. Gin Ichimaru, captain of squad three. The captain, huh? Mm -mm -mm. Now, Gajimbo, what is going on here? <clears throat> captain Gin! Yes, in the living flesh, or spirit. So, Jidambo, why exactly are you opening the gate? Especially for these Ryoko. You know that's against the law. I... I was defeated in combat, sir. I have no right to stop them. No right? That doesn't make any sense. I've never heard of any law of that nature. If a gate's guardian is defeated, well, that doesn't mean you open the gate. You keep fighting to stop the intruders. Or you die. With a quick draw of his blade, likely his Zanpakuto, one of Gidambo's arms were cut, causing him to lower a bit, but still holding the gate up aright. As Gein would go in for another strike, he would quickly be stopped by both Clark and Ichigo the two brothers pushing him back with authority. Yorichi would warn them to stop. Even if all of their power was combined, they probably weren't capable of taking down a captain. But the two boys were hard of hearing. Isn't he supposed to be your comrade? Ichigo would ask. Why would you try to kill one of your own? Clark would say. In the Serite, law and order must be kept at all costs. If Jidambo fails at his job, then proper punishment must be dealt. Oh, so you're one of those guys, huh? Ichigo said. 
You just believe in your stupid laws and that's the only thing that matters. That's right. So tell me this then. What happens if you break the law, huh? You're just going to accept your death like a man? No qualms, no fuss? <laughs> Absolutely. If death was to be carried out upon me, I'd have no reason to fight it. It means I would have failed at my job. And trust, I have no intentions on failing. That's tough to hear, Ichigo said. Because, unfortunately for you, you're about to see what being a failure feels like firsthand. I only hope that the higher-ups are as merciful upon you as you were upon our good friend Jidambo. Ichigo, don't worry. He's nothing special. We can take him together. No, you can't, Yorichi would say. You need to get out of there right now. Huh? Now, Jean would say, feel the sting of my Zanpak toe. Impale him, Shinso. Gein had backed away as he thrusted his blade forward, the blade now extending its length and reach, as both Clark and Ichigo would take the brunt of the attack, blocking it as all three of them, Clark, Ichigo, and Jadambo, would all be launched out of the Serate. Gein would wave and smile as the walls closed down behind them. The people of the Ryokan district would look on in shock. They weren't the ones to like trouble coming to their area. Sure, from time to time, you had ruffians believing that they could just barge into the Serate if they wanted, and usually it was met with a swift in severe death, usually at the hands of Jadambo of all people, but for a captain to have shown up, it meant that things had to be really serious. For now, though, they can only focus on finding another way in. But before doing that, Ichigo would ask for Orihime to help heal Jadambo's arm, the giant being touched by the young girl's kindness. And now Ichigo was getting a chance to see a few of Orihime's powers in action. Just as in the original timeline, Orihime still had access to the flower pendant fairies that were capable of acquiescing to her commands to either create powerful defensive barriers or, in this case, to heal an injury. But Ichigo also saw something else. She was sporting a weird green ring on her left hand. He hadn't seen her use it yet, but he had been meaning to ask. So, what's with that ring Orihime is wearing? Ichigo would ask Chad. It was a part of her training. When she, myself, and Lois, we were all training under Yorichi. For some reason, our spiritual power was drawn to a particular item Something that meant a lot to us. I see. And what about you? Oh, me? Chad would pull out a chain that he was wearing under his clothes. On the chain, he saw a tiny sledgehammer. When Chad pulled it off of the chain, unclipping it, he held it in his right hand. His right hand would then turn and transform his whole arm into something else. It was metallic with streaks of black and red, crimson. It looked like an arm made out of some type of space steel. And that tiny sledgehammer had turned into that large sledgehammer that they found on Clark's spaceship. Oh, that's where that sledgehammer went. So you kept it with you? Clark would ask. Mm-hmm. It felt, well, I felt. I had a connection to it, and for some reason, it shrunk whenever I was training, but whenever I infuse it with my spirit power, it transforms into its full size, and so does my arm. Wow, Chad, it's like you've got an arm of steel. That's about the gist of it. With a swing of this hammer, it seems like there's nothing I can't stop. 
oh, so did something similar happen with Orihime? That flower pendant, yes. But there's also something with that ring. Apparently, it's from her uncle on her mother's side. He was a pilot in the U.S. Army. When he passed away, he gave it to Orihime as a keepsake. She's never opened it until now, apparently, but it's said it has great power. She can make anything with her mind and will. Make anything? You'll probably see in due time. Um, and uh, Clark would ask to Lois, What did you get? Well, funny enough, I have this dial. Lois would pull it out of her back pocket and show it to the group. A dial? What is it, like an old phone dial? Yeah, kinda, but it has a really nifty trick. Here, I'll show you. Lois smiled proudly as she pulled out the phone dial from the side of her pocket. I call it the H dial. Why the H dial? Because it's like dial H, you know, dial H for hero. That's me. Oh, you're, you're a hero now? Well, I think I am. Okay, look, I'll show you. First... I press number four, then the pound number, then I flick this little thing right here, and voila! Lois would be enamored in an aura of red energy, swirling around her as she quickly transformed into a superhero. She was wearing what appeared to be a rather, mm, rather tight red suit that was hugging her in all the right places she had on a red mask with lightning bolts on the side of her ears a yellow lightning bolt on her chest lightning bolts all around her and she was wearing yellow boots Ooh, this is my favorite i call this look speedster lois speedster lois mm -hmm. watch this i'm gonna see if i can run around the whole serate be back in the flash what the hell? I Ichigo said, where did Lois go? Uh, she said she's running around the whole Serate. About two minutes later. Okay, I'm back. Woo! Yeah, this place is... This place is hella big. Hella big. You just ran around the whole Serate in two minutes. <clears throat> Well, to be more specific, Yorichi was said, it was two minutes and 46 seconds. I counted. Still, Uriyu would chime in. That's hella amount of speed, even if it was only two minutes and 46 seconds. I know. I have no idea how this happens. I just press a number, hit the pound sign, dial up the little thingy, and for like eight minutes at a time, I can turn into a hero. How the hell is that even possible, Ichigo would ask. I have no clue. Um, this is the one I've been using. It's kind of been my favorite. Like, getting chores done has been a breeze. Meanwhile, in another parallel universe, far, far away. How's he doing, Koteri would ask. He's doing all right now, Miss Koteri. Shito has been working on the cosmic treadmill for who knows how long. He's trying to hit his mock speed. Which one is that? We believe he's trying to go for Mach 4. All right, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> Not again. Again? Kotori would ask. Shito, get a grip. What's going on with you? I don't know. For some reason, my power just cuts off for eight minutes at a time. I don't know what's going on. Oh. Oh. Ugh. Well, that was rather unfortunate, Dr. Wells said. This is one strange phenomena. For some reason, his power just keeps flickering on and off. At random times, too. Well, this can't be good. We've got to figure out a way to fix that. Uh, I don't know. You know what? 
I'm calling it quits for the day. I'm going home. Ooh, we're going home. Ooh, can we have omelet rice? Yeah, sure. Whatever. I'm going back down. So, uh, yeah, Lois would say. Apparently, I can turn into different superheroes. Well, what else have you turned into? Well, I turned into a strange plant-like creature one time. Uh, don't really know what I'm supposed to do with that, but I did get to kickstart my garden a lot sooner, and it helped out Grandma and Grandpa. And for other ones, they're weird, strange, not entirely sure what they are, but I'm figuring it out as I go. You have all grown in your powers, Yorichi would say. But we need to figure out a way to get into the Serite. I'm going to ask around, but I believe I know a way we can help. From here, the story would continue on similar to how it did in the original timeline. Up until the point of them meeting the wild hog rider and member of the Serite, a rather crude individual by the name of Ganju, Ganju Shiba. It didn't take long for both he and Ichigo to butt heads, but for Yorichi, the cat's main focus was finding his sister, Kukaku. Kukaku had an interesting service in the Soul Society, to say the least. To be more specific, she was in the business of fireworks, and... She had the know-how to get you places you needed to be. For Kokaku, she had a plan of getting them into the Serite, with nothing better than a fireworks cannon. The way it would work was that the group were going to use an object known as a spirit orb. Using it to channel their spiritual power, they would create a giant orb for themselves to collide into the dome of the Serite and would allow for them to break in. She was also going to be sending her younger brother along, the aforementioned Ganju, who would be serving as their assistant to also help out Yorichi and keep who she deemed as the brats in line. While he and Ichigo didn't see eye to eye, he did help him in learning how to use the spirit orb and to draw out his spiritual power and potential. Each one were capable of doing so, but for Ichigo, and even for Clark, it was a lot easier said than done. Although for Clark, as Kukaku would put it, he already had his own spirit orb of sorts. It was thin, but she could tell there was a veil of spiritual energy already around his body. It was like he had the orb just around him 24-7. So he was going to help serve as the conduit to help keep it all flowing and well-constructed. It took about two days time but eventually the cannon would be ready to fire everyone loaded up inside as they formed into the spirit orb and with the shot being fired the giant spirit orb cannonball would launch high into the air the operation was going to go smoothly if everyone played their part most of the group would stay focused on keeping the orb intact while ganju would focus on guiding the orb Clark, with his skill and ability, would help maintain and keep it together, as well as using his power of flight to help get them in the air and in the right position. Clark figured that if he used his x-ray vision and focused hard enough, he could likely find where Rukia was. And sure enough, as they launched into the night sky, as he scombed through the area of the Serite, he eventually found her. It's over near that cliffside. That's where she's being kept. Wait, you can see her that far? It's faint. I can see the outline of her. But yeah, I can't mistake it. That's got to be Rukia. We'll have to head towards the east. Wait, Ichigo, you need to keep focus, Ganju would say. Wh what are you talking about? We already know where Rukia is. If we can land just over where she is, we can get her back in one fell swoop. Besides, once we break hold of this thing, Clark, all you gotta do is swoop all of us up and then bust us straight out. Wait a minute, Ichigo, Ganju would say. If you get all startled up, we're gonna end up breaking out of the... Oh, crap. What? What happened? Everyone, hold on!
Yurichi would yell out to everyone. They ended up getting caught through the vortex as their orb crashed into the top of the Serite. Other Soul Reapers and everyone under below watching as what was taking place. In the meantime, a meeting was being held. The captains of the 13 squads had all been called together, oversawn by the captain of squad one, Yamamoto. All were present, save for the captain of squad 13. But they were also waiting for someone else. The captain of squad 99. Hmm, what's the meaning of this? Kimpachi would say to Yamamoto. You don't normally call for the captain of squad 99. He hardly ever attends these things. I believe the matter is of the utmost importance. I'd wish to know where the captain of squad 13 is. He said he wasn't doing too well, Gein would chime in. But he does send his regards. <laughs> Mayuri, another captain as well, knew full intentions of why this meeting was being called. It was about Gein, about what he did do, or rather what he didn't, allowing the Ryoko to escape. Do you have any defense for yourself? Defense? What defense could I possibly make? I believed I had done enough of my duty. I made a mistake. It's my bad. Besides, it's nothing but mere Ryoka. It's nothing that we have to worry about. It's the fact that they were even able to get through that gate for just a brief moment. This isn't something that can be taken lightly. Sosuke Aizen would be watching on from a distance eyeing up Gein and sizing him. He could tell there was more to it than what Gein was saying. It was obvious to everyone. If Gein had wanted to make sure the Ryoka were dead, they would have been dead. But what could the angle have been for not finishing them off? You finally arrived. Captain of Squad 99. John Jones. Captain Yamamoto. Everyone. The famed John Jones, Kinpachi would say. So, after nearly 200 years, you decide to grace us with your presence. The call seemed urgent. I came as quickly as I could. My lieutenants have already been stationed at their post. So, with no real other work to do, I decided that coming along would be necessary. What seems to be the issue? It's among the Ryoka that have tried to breach through the western gate of the Serate. Ryoka. Rather peculiar, though I doubt it requires my attention. But it does. One of the Ryoka was a Kryptonian. Murmurs would start to move throughout the captains. There's no way. A Kryptonian? I thought they all died, right? Yeah, like at least over, what, 16, 17 years ago? The planet Krypton got blown up. What other Kryptonians would be left? There was a survivor, Yamamoto would say. Somehow a Kryptonian has made its way to Earth, and even more so has become familiar with the skills of using spirit energy. This is dangerous. You know that of all of those who are forbidden from learning our techniques, our ways, Kryptonians are among the top of the list. A Ryoka Kryptonian, John would say. This is most interesting. It's understandable why you've called me. If the Kryptonian is still alive, then leave him to me. I will bring him in and get to the bottom of things. It was just then that they could hear the sound of the warning alarm being pounded. What's the meaning of this? 
All captains, all lieutenants, all those on standby. The Serete is under breach. I repeat, the Serete is under breach. The Serete? How the hell is that even possible? No one's even supposed to be able to get through that barrier. It's made of Seki Seki. What could even break through that? Yamamoto would dismiss the meaning, announcing that Gein and his punishment would be dealt with later. In the meantime, they looked on to see a bright light up in the sky. It was Ichigo and the others. The spirit orb had managed to break through the barrier of the Secretary, but they all went scattering in different directions, despite their attempts to hold on. Clark and Lois landed in one spot, Orihime and Uryu another. Ichigo was attached to Ganju as they fell, and Chad and Yurichi were on their own. The first part had been complete. They had now breached into the Secretary, and they were now in the heart of the Soul Society. However, their enemies were aware of their presence, and they were surely to be upon them. In the meantime, Rukia would watch on, looking at the spectacle from off in the distance as she stood in the Tower of Penance. Her execution date had been moved up, now from 25 days to only 14. As Clark and Lois would land, Clark would fly high into the sky, looking around to try to see where the others had gone, and they were pretty far apart. What do we do? Lois would ask. I'm going to use my super sound to try to contact everyone. Super sound? I can echo my voice pretty loudly when I take a deep breath. I'm going to be pretty far, but I'm going to try to get everyone coordinated. You might want to take a few steps back. Lois would do so and cover her ears as Clark took a deep breath before bellowing. Everybody! We're all okay! We need to make our way to the tower in the east! That's where we'll find her! Clark finally turned around to the tower in the east, still far off, but just within earshot of Rukia. <gasps> Hang on, Rukia! We're here! We're coming to save you! Just hang on a little while longer! Ichigo and I are here! We're coming! It was just barely, but Rukia could hear Clark's voice. A voice she thought she'd never hear again. And his message. For the first time since she had returned, she did something that she thought she'd never do. in her own heart for that brief moment Rukia gained something she thought she'd never feel again a feeling of hope this concludes Bleach Legacy What If Superman Wasn't Bleach Season 2 Part 3 as always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned tomorrow as we continue with Bleach Legacy, What If Superman Was in Bleach, Season 2, Part 4. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. 
signing off, and I'll see you next time.